Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS. Ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. In tonight's episode, Overground Railroad, the part of Lieutenant Fontaine, OSS agent who helped thousands of American airmen escape to safety, is played by Les Tremaine. The story is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. When a flyer was forced down behind enemy lines, he was just another fugitive, moving cautiously at night to avoid detection, fighting for survival. His shelter was a haystack or a hedgerow. For food, he dug raw potatoes or turnips from the field. And in his panic, he was always just one step ahead of the Gestapo, with no knowledge of the country and no friend to whom he could turn. A few of the lucky ones managed to escape back to England. I met one of those lucky ones in Colonel Johnson's office at OSS headquarters in London. Lieutenant Fontaine, this is Major Davidson. How do you do, Major? Glad to know you, Fontaine. Now, before I ask Major Davidson to tell you a story, I want to say something. Yes, Colonel Johnson? At its narrowest, the English Channel is only 20 miles wide. Yet it took Major Davidson here more than a year to get across. And hundreds of Allied pilots all over France haven't been able to make it yet. And if something isn't done to help them, they never will. But, Colonel, with the Nazis occupying France... With the Nazis occupying France, the channel is still only 20 miles wide. Our trouble has been that up to now, we've had no contact with the French underground. No way of helping them smuggle pilots out of France. All right, Major Davidson, go ahead and tell your story now. Well, I was shot down over the south of France, coming back from a bombing mission... The rest of the crew was killed. It was just my co-pilot, Johnny Porter, and me left. Yes. Go on, Major. We figured our numbers were up. Any flyer forced down on enemy territory figures that nowadays, but uh, we were lucky. A farmer picked us up and hit us overnight. And then the next morning, a big black limousine drove up, and a woman about 60 got out. She took us to her house in Paris and kept us there. She found a way to smuggle us across the channel with a fisherman just a few days ago. Who was this woman, Major? Her name is Madame Annette Jobert. I used to tell her she meant more to the Yankee team than Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> During the time we were with her, she managed to collect two more of our boys, but she has no way of getting them out of France. Well, what do you think, Fontaine? Just what you think, Colonel. For the first time, OSS has a lead, a contact. What'd you say this woman's name was, Major? A uh, Jobert, Madame Annette Jobert, and quite a gal, too. Colonel Johnson, with her help, maybe we can set up a chain of um, way stations, establish a, uh, shall we say, an overland railroad, collect our flyers and move them like chessmen right across France to the Channel. How soon can you leave? Anytime you say, Colonel Johnson. Anytime. Oh, by the way, Major... How will I be able to identify myself to Madame Jobert? Did you agree on any uh, code word or anything? <laughs> yes. Here you are. <laughs> A black lace garter. I left London a few days later and landed the next morning on the coast of France. A disguised fishing boat let me off and I made my way to Paris undetected. It was spring, 1944. I was going to know April in Paris, but not the way any American tourist before the war had known it. The red dawn was touching the roofs of Paris and the golden dome of the Pantheon. Most of the city was still dreaming of other, better springtimes before the Germans came. 
Then the city started to wake up. Bakers were at work through the windows, wetting the dough. The waiters from the cafes were sweeping into the gutter the cigarette butts that their customers had dropped under the tables the night before. For a few minutes, it was the Paris my mother had talked about. And then, an official Nazi car turned the corner, and I knew that everything had changed. I made my way to 46 Rue Dancy, where I'd find Madame Annette Jobert. Madame Jobert! Madame Jobert! What are you doing making all that racket so early in the morning? People are still trying to sleep here. Well, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm looking for Madame Annette Jobert. This is her house, isn't it? Oui, it is her house. Did you see her go out this morning? Do you think I have nothing better to do than keep an account of her comings and goings? But I... I did not see her go out this morning, and I have not seen her go out any morning for a week. She has moved. Moved? If you take the trouble to look, you'll see the windows are all boarded up. Madame! Madame, please! I've got to locate her. I, I'm her nephew. Ask her good friends, the Germans, where she is. Go to the Gestapo. Now, wait a minute, please! I was up a blind alley. I had come to Paris because I had a contact. Now the contact was gone. Uh, there you are, monsieur. More café. Merci. Uh, you're the first one in my café this morning. Oh, I remember other springs. It was always crowded at this time. Uh, what is it, monsieur? Do you not feel well? Something wrong? Oh, no, no, not, uh, not wrong, exactly. It's just that I came to Paris to see my aunt. It seems she's moved and left no forwarding address. Oh, what a pity. But there is always one way to find her. A way? What is it? You have only to go to the Gestapo and ask. They will tell you. Go to the Gestapo and ask. Sure, why not? OSS wasn't particular who helped us as long as we got the help. I was sure Colonel Johnson wouldn't object to my letting even the Gestapo give us a hand. I, I beg your pardon. I can't just hear on the phone. Wait a minute. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, Herr Commandant. Ja, augenblicklich. Für augenblicklich, ja, ich werde augenblicklich einen Eilboten rüber schicken. Jawohl, Herr Kommandant, jawohl. Na, what is it? What do you want? Uh, I would like some information. What kind of information? I... I arrived from south of France this morning. I came to visit my aunt. Only I discovered when I got here that she had moved. Well, what do you want us to do about it? Well, I merely request her change of address. I felt certain it would be in the records of the Gestapo. No, natürlich is in our records. The address or change of address of anyone in Paris is listed with us. Uh, what's the name of your aunt? Jobert. Madame Annette Jobert, Sergeant. Mm -hmm. yeah, let me see your papers. Oh, yes, see. There you are. Mm -hmm. well, these papers of yours intrigue me. Never seen any like them before. Is uh, something wrong with them? What? No. Yeah, on the contrary, they are filled out extremely accurately. Usually one thing or another is omitted. I congratulate you on your thoroughness. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. Thank you. Uh, Herr Commandant, um, uh, there is a Frenchman at the front desk who is trying to locate his aunt, uh, uh, Madame Annette Robert. Yeah, Commandant. Jawohl, I'll send him in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Uh, wait, wait, one other thing. Uh, your suitcase. What? My suitcase? Uh, no one is allowed past this desk without having his luggage or packages checked. Uh, put your suitcase up here and open it. The suitcase was filled with clothing, but there was a false bottom to it. And in the false bottom was a shortwave radio. If the sergeant accidentally pushed the button that would reveal the radio... What are you so slow about? Here, give me that suitcase. Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, I bet that's a schwer. 
What do you mean, it talks? Well, no, 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 it's... Uh, oh, oh, no, it's uh, no, no, mind, just metal, open but... it. Yeah, yes. There. There, you see? Just personal articles. Yeah. <laughs> so I see. <laughs> now, do you think I expected you to walk into Gestapo headquarters with a time bomb or a shortwave radio in your suitcase, perhaps? <laughs> uh, that's just routine. I must check up everything. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Commandant's office is right down the hall. First door you come to on the right. Sit down, sit down, Monsieur Pontin. A cigar? These wine-soaked French cigars are very good. Thank you, Herr Commandant. I never resist a good cigar or a pretty girl. You uh, wonder, perhaps, why I am seeing you personally about this matter of locating your aunt, eh? Uh, whatever the reason, Commandant Kurtz, I, I'm flattered. Oh, not at all. Tell your aunt for me that I am delighted to render her this little service. A fine woman, a delightful woman, and a clever woman, too. She's been most cooperative. Oh, I, I'm sure she has. Commandant Kurtz, uh, it is most urgent that I find her. Uh, urgent? How urgent? I, uh, I have news for her about my uncle, uh, her brother, who is very ill in the south of France. Ah, a pity. Uh, tell her for me that if she desires to travel, I will arrange for the necessary permit, of course. Well, you're very kind. Not at all, not at all. You now, let me see. Ah, ah, yeah, here it is. She is boarded up her house at 46 Rue Danzig, as you know, and moved to another residence 20 kilometers southwest of Pels in the village of Tori Ferrot. Here, yeah, yeah. write out the exact address. Mm. Thank you for your help, Herr Commandant. I assure you, uh, I will never forget it. I took a train to the village of Tori Ferrot, and all the way I kept thinking about Madame Jobin. The German high command evidently considered her one of the most important collaborationists. We considered her our most important contact with the French underground. She certainly had someone fooled. I hoped it was the Nazis. Madame Joubert is in here, monsieur, in the library. Merci. Monsieur Fontaine, madame. Come in. Come in. Cecile, you may go and close the door. Oui, madame. Come close. No, come closer. Let me have a good look at you. Eh bien, it's quite far enough. Now, what's all this nonsense about being my nephew? What's the matter, Auntie? Don't you recognize me? I've never seen you before in my life. I have regards for you from friends. Friends? Major Norman Davidson and uh, Lieutenant Johnny Porter. I've never heard of them. You don't remember helping to smuggle them across the channel, Auntie? This is insolence. Of what are you accusing me? Of being an important link in the French underground. Nonsense. I know of no underground. If there is one, it does not concern me. Now go back and tell them at Gestapo headquarters that they have made a mistake. And tell Commandant Kurtz I am hurt at his suspicions of me. What makes you think the Gestapo sent me? Only the Gestapo knows my change of address. They were very obliging. They gave it to me. I ask you to leave, monsieur. I am very busy this afternoon. I believe you lost this, Madame Joubert. That black lace garter, where did you get it? It was given to me by Major Davidson, who says you mean more to the Yankee team than Joe DiMaggio. (laughs) He also told me to give you a great big kiss for him. (laughs) Well, bless my heart. (laughs) Bless my heart, indeed. You still want me to leave? Uh, You are as fresh as all Americans. Sit down, (laughs) sit down. Thank you. So you just walked in and asked the the Gestapo. Oh, stupid (laughs) swine. Oh, I'd like to see their faces if they knew. Oh, come, 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 Madame Joubert. Is that a way to talk? They think very highly of you. Which is just what I want them to think. Where are the other two pilots now, madame? I deposited them in a monastery in the south for safety. Mm -hmm. But I have no way to get them to the channel. Look, madame Joubert. Oui? Perhaps you and I can establish a chain of way stations, safe houses across France. Then the OSS can collect the hundreds of flyers who were shot down and 
You can send them back to safety. Yes, but how could I do that without help, without a way to contact England? I have a radio in the suitcase. Oh, oh, oh. Very well. In the morning, we will drive to the monastery. The monks there are friendly. They would be more than glad, I'm sure, to let us use that as a base to start operations. Oh, great. That's wonderful, Madame Jobert. <laughs> uh, you had a kiss for me from Major Davidson. Where is it? Right here, Auntie. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> and now, young man, you will oblige me by giving me back my garter. Yeah. Yeah, she was quite a girl, all right, Madame Jobert. She gave me a suite of rooms to myself, got me a chauffeur's uniform, decided my name should be Claude. And in the morning, we set out for the monastery. Yes, yes, Lieutenant Fontaine. Hey, Claude, that is just what we will do. Yes. OSS will furnish each member of an air crew with detailed escape maps when they are briefed in England, pinpointing the friendly areas on the route of every mission. Do you think these safe houses will be difficult to set up? Oh, not too difficult, I think. I know already of the home of a sympathetic parish priest, a church, a school, a farmhouse, and I have many wealthy friends who will be willing, I am sure. Why are you slowing down? Nazi guard wants me to stop. Uh, don't worry, I have all the necessary permits. Hey! Let me see your permit to travel. Uh, here you are. This is a great inconvenience. I will report it to my friend, Commandant Kurtz. Commandant Kurtz? Ach, yeah. I, I see you, you have his personal stamp on, on this pass. Where are you headed for, Madame Joubert? I have business in the village. Ah. I, I, I would suggest you, you do not go today. Why not? There is to be an execution in the square. Not very pleasant, madame. Execution? What are you talking about? We found 35 tons of arms and, and materials that were stolen from German supply trains. Found all that? Where? In, in the monastery. The monastery? I cannot believe that. Yeah, but it is true. And today they will be shot. Five of them. I see. Claude, continue. You may go if you like, but it will not be very pleasant. Claude, continue. Oui, madame. discovered the supplies in the monastery. What about the two American flyers you had hidden there? Did they discover them too? Are they among the five? Quickly. Drive quickly, Claude. We reached the square, parked the car and got out. The people were huddled in little whispering groups... At the far end of the square stood the monastery, and lined up at the wall were five monks, their heads lowered, their hands fingering the crosses around their necks. Facing them was a Nazi firing squad. Madame Joubert grabbed my arm. What are we to do? I don't think there's anything we can do. Shh! Let this be a lesson to you people of this village. This is what happens to those who fight against us. These five will be shot. The other monks from the monastery will be sent to Germany. You understand? Take a good look. Learn your lesson well. Ready? Ready? Fire! <laughs> Madame Joubert and I went back to the car. But, Madame Joubert, if you drive back yourself, what will the guard say who stopped us before? I am an excellent liar. I will simply tell him I went to see a sick relative and left you there to help. But... I must drive back immediately. As I told you, I am giving a birthday party for Commandant Kurtz. I hope he does not live to see his next. Now, you go to the convent. It is only a few kilometers from here. 
You know what to do. Yes, I know what to do. Madame Joubert, what do you think happened to those two pilots who were hidden in the monastery? They were probably found and killed. But, Lieutenant Fontaine, we must go on with our plans. Some have been killed, we... But many can be saved. I said goodbye to her. She drove away. The convent of Our Sacred Lady was within walking distance. When I reached the gate, I saw an avenue of acacia trees leading to the great ornate iron door. The center panel formed the figure of the Virgin Mary. It was really spring in these gardens. A peaceful sanctuary in a war-ridden world. What is your wish? I would like to see the Mother Superior. Follow me. I followed the nun through the spacious hall. It was part vestry, part repository of art objects. The walls were hung with darkened old paintings of the Holy Family. In glass chests along the vestry, religious utensils of gold and silver had been stored. This is the office of Mother Angeline. Come. So you want me to let you use the convent of our sacred lady as a base for your underground operations? Mother Angeline, if you know the risk yourself and refuse, I can't find it in my heart to blame you. But if you agree, I want you to know first just what those risks are. Tell me, my son. I've just come from the village. The monastery there was raided last night. With my own eyes, I saw five of the monks shot. The others were hauled away by the Nazis. Only God knows where. I know about that. I heard this morning... If this convent is used as a hideout and the shortwave radio is hidden here, can you imagine what the Germans would do if they found out? You would expect no better treatment than the monks received. I thank you for telling me this. You are right. It is a great risk. I have many under my care here. They depend on my wisdom to do the right thing. Of course. You have the other sisters to consider. You came here today to convince me of your cause. I'm afraid I must disappoint you. What's that? You see, I... What's the matter? A German armored car. I can see it from the window. Coming here? I'm afraid so. It is the first time we have been raided. I am not looking forward to their muddy boots in this place of God. They'll find me, Mother Angeline. What can I do? Where can I hide? They are at the door. You rang for me, my mère? Yes, Sister Therese. Give my friend one of the sister's robes. One long enough to cover him. And a hood. Oui, my mère. The other sisters? Are they already in the chapel? Oui, my mère. They have started the afternoon adoration. See that my friend joins them in prayer. Then then open the main door. We have visitors. I put the nun's robes over my suit and went with Sister Teresa to the chapel. I knelt with the others. About 20 benches divided by a middle aisle provided seats for the worshippers. At the far end of the room was a high pulpit... Many of the kneeling prayed with arms stretched out, symbolizing the form of the cross. The sister next to me clasped her hands, and on her ring finger was the silver emblem of a bride of Christ. They prayed almost silently. Hers were the only words I heard. O maternal power of the universe, mother of divine grace, pray for us. Our wisest virgin, our kindly virgin, pray for us. Pray for the sick world. Good 
Good sisters, these soldiers wish to search the chapel. I must bow to their wishes and ask you to file back to your cells. Leave now, quickly and quietly, please. My head lowered, the hood covering my face. I got into the line with the sisters. I bent my knees slightly so that the robes would cover the chauffeur's boots I was wearing. I lowered my head even more as I passed the SS Hauptmann, who was standing with his men next to the Mother Superior at the door. I regret the necessity of disturbing your prayer, Mother Angeline. But after the unfortunate incident in the monastery last night, I feel it is necessary. You may search this convent from top to bottom, as you are already doing. You will find nothing in this house of God to interest you, I'm sure. Hurry, sisters, hurry, back to your cells. They're really gone, Mother Angeline? Of course, they found nothing here. You can take that robe off now. You look uncomfortable in it. (laughs) Thank you for protecting me. I believe now. But we have not finished our conversation. Mother Angeline, you told me I could not convince you about our cause. You said you'd have to disappoint me. I took that as your answer. Let me consult two of the other sisters first. Wait. Oui, ma mère. Our two sisters, those in the sacristy. Send them here, please, Sister Celeste. A few minutes later... Sister Celeste returned, followed by the two other nuns. Their arms folded and heads lowered, they shuffled into the room. And then, all of a sudden, I noticed broad-toed army boots protruding beneath the long black dresses. One of the heads raised, and I saw that he needed a shave. Mother Angeline, I I don't understand... Th- these men? They are American pilots brought here yesterday when the monks received underground information that the monastery would be raided. Major Kirstein, Captain Lewis, this is Lieutenant Fontaine of the OSS. OSS? Oh, yes, yes, that's great. Have you got a way of getting us out of France, Lieutenant? Yeah. Say, what happened to Madame Jobert? she all right? Uh, yeah, yeah, she's all right. <laughs> Uh, Mother Angeline, you you led me to believe I wouldn't be able to convince you of our cause. Of course not, son. How could you, since I was already convinced? The convent of our sacred lady was the first link in a chain of safe houses that was forged within a couple of months under Madame Jobert's leadership. We moved Major Kirstein and Captain Lewis along that chain until they reached the coast of France. They waited, hidden in a farmer's barn, while I established contact with headquarters in London. Agent Fontaine to OSS headquarters in London. Overground railroad established. Train on the tracks. Passengers ready to leave and waiting. Pick them up and make room for more to come. did come. Over 2,000 more airmen who were shot down in occupied France rode the overground railroad established by Lieutenant Claude Fontaine to safety. Thus, once again, the report of another OSS agent closed with the words, Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on Cloak and Dagger. Heard in tonight's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Lieutenant Fontaine was Les Tremaine, Madame Jobert, Bryna Rayburn, and Mother Angeline Lily Valenti. The script was written by Winifred Wolf and Jack Gordon. The music was under the direction of John Gart. Sound effects by John Powers and Manny Siegel. Today's OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program was produced by Louis G. Cowan. Three times mean good times on NBC.